and these are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Rich Carroll with IO Integration. Uh, thank you all for making time for us today. We're going to be discussing how uh, industry leaders use digital asset management to enhance uh, customer experience and maximize profits. I have a great team today uh, on the line to have a good sort of open discussion. Uh, we certainly want you to participate as well. Uh, at the moment, we currently have you muted, but there is a chat bar within the GoToWebinar control panel. Please, if you have any questions, uh, direct your questions into that chat area. We will either comment on them in line or we'll save them towards the end of our conversation. We're currently scheduled for about an hour, but I'll leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. On the phone today, uh, we have an all-star cast. I will start with Brian Atkins. He is the Senior Manager of Enterprise Content Management and Marketing Technology with JCPenney down in Plano, Texas. Say hello, Brian. Hi, everyone. I also have John Bookmeyer, who is the Director of Digital Asset Management for Team Detroit in Detroit, and they are a division of the WPP group of agencies. Say hello, John. Did we lose John, or maybe John is still on mute? Hey, we're going back. Hi, John. How are you? Hey, good. Excellent. We also have Mohan Taylor, who is the uh, CTO for Nurse Plains, uh, based out of uh, Toronto, Canada. Say hello, Mohan. Hi there. And finally, we have uh, Mark Reese Thomas, who is the president of eGraphics. Uh, they are a production company under the Omnicom channel based on the West Coast. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Excellent. So uh, I'm going to start by actually uh, tossing you into the bus first, Mark, since you were my last one to be uh, introduced. But can you give us, you know, um, basically, as far as your content production processes, what are some of the biggest sort of challenges you face, and how do you use technology to kind of resolve those marketing challenges? I think the biggest challenge is the, our geography and our sheer number of clients that we work with. So most of our engagement is with agencies with brands, and most of them have one asset engine or other. And it's always everybody's definition of what an asset is. And um, you know, sky's production are very simple. It's something that we can repurpose and make. Whereas some of our clients, an asset to them could just be a uh, an archive or a PDF. So trying to get the language right seems to be the biggest challenge of all. And then the other is finding technologies pretty good APIs that we can integrate with. I think that's one of the other areas. Uh, down solutions that are maybe being built in someone's back room and then trying to hook into it to facilitate our efficiency of our production um, almost becomes a, a challenge in its own way. But the other sort of thing I think that most uh, agencies struggle with. Brian, do you see similar challenges at JP Penny, or is it more about language and maybe uh, geographic specific information? How you sell things in the Northeast different than how you sell things in the Southwest? Well, ours is really based more on just the the internal efficiency and security. I mean, our need in our content production is really revolves around our internal efficiencies, and as we kind of increase the the breadth of channels, if you will, and trying to maintain a, a specific brand consistency. And, and one of the things that Mark said is that, you know, it's got to me was really trying to tie it to the, the multiple client solutions. On our side, our issue is we have internal clients. And so if we have, in other words, we have multiple teams, we have a social media team and an email marketing team and a print team and a direct mail or a targeted marketing team. And in order to prevent from from recreating those assets multiple times and really wasting time and money, you know, our issue in content creation revolves around being able to leverage that content across those channels. So it's almost as if the the different business units themselves are uh, competing against or or conflicting with each other, trying to get the marketing execution done. Is that correct? Yeah, so, you know, it, it's a matter of, uh, you know, cost and efficiency. In other words, we have 10 channels and we need the same product to be, you know, advertised for a particular promotion. We're, we're trying to avoid having to take that picture 10 times. And, and the cost and the time that's associated with that 
Um, and, and our bigger issue, you know, kind of the, the first thing, the driving force behind us looking into evolving to more of a, a, a technology-based solution a few years ago was built around the idea that our processes not only were inefficient for the production process, but were also extremely um, you know, risky as far as permissions and rights controls. You know, we would get images in from the studios and we would basically just put them on unprotected shares. And so we had no real way of managing or controlling approved assets versus um, unapproved or unretouched assets. If we had you know, legal or product um, availability concerns, we had no real way of, of knowing where that content had been used. And then from our outside agency partner side, so we had uh, ad agencies that were helping us with particular elements of our advertising. We didn't really have a way to provide uh, access to our assets to, to those groups. And so we kind of had some internal production efficiency needs that, that really had to be met in order to, to uh, kind of get better use out of our time and money. And, and then we had some, some legal and, uh, and product level concerns with making sure that we knew what was being used, when and where. And then, you know, kind of the, our third need was to be able to make sure that we had the ability to um, provide a, a portal, if you will, or a way for uh, agencies or outside um, groups that needed access to that content for any reason to be able to access it. Well, and, and I know the agencies have the same sort of challenge on the other side of that coin. You know, I, uh, John Bookmeyer deals with a automobile uh, customer in particular that not only is it just about the images that are being managed internally within the agency, but you also have to account for, you know, just the, the sheer uh, tremendous number of assets that are being created, not just in Detroit, but globally. And how do you manage not just the rights, but, you know, delivering those assets in a, in a proper and timely fashion to all those customers? Yeah, you know, um, uh, Brian's Brian's view from a um, um, from a client side is, is is very very like what we're dealing with here at Team Detroit. Uh, it's a massive operation, uh, a ton of different channels going on. We're executing those deliverables very very well. We have a good opportunity for improvement of um, uh, aligning those channels. So uh, we've done a great job in the past couple of years on that. Uh, with our, our various tools. Um, and in parallel, we're trying to do the same thing with, with markets all over the world. Uh, multiple systems and, uh, and then trying to manage that, those rights. Video is really uh, a, a, a tremendous challenge and all the, the various uses of that, uh, where it goes, how long it's up, when we're pulling it down, um, and then and then, very importantly, is, is uh, gaining some analytical uh, information on those two. So, um, it is a it's a tremendous challenge, and it is an ongoing one. Um, we, we've definitely seen some some great efficiencies in the past few years on this. Well, um, and and certainly as we move beyond the traditional sort of siloed approach to the different channels, those being print, online, and, and broadcast, you know, social media in particular. Um, has a tremendous need for good analytics on the back end. Um, Mohan, can you speak a little bit about maybe how that's helping shape the the direction of the products themselves? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're, we're really um, interested in closing the loop, I think is probably the best way to describe it. Um, mm -hmm. I think social channels offer us a, a very unique advantage. They have some challenges in the global nature and trying to still stay relevant, but they also have some great advantages where we actually get immediate um, feedback and what we're really interested in is how can we take that feedback and push it back into the process to close the loop um, so we can get feedback right at the source about how our um, social media campaigns are actually working or not working um, and allow us to be uh, more agile in that process. Um, I think it's kind of been demanded these days and at the moment most of that process is fairly ad hoc. Um, so what we're interested in is getting it out, but actually getting it out in a manageable way so we keep track of what's out there so that we can actually you know, take it down when it's no longer relevant and also get info back about how it's being used. Yeah, and I'll add into that that from, from our perspective, um, we have a, a 
we have that need for kind of those social media analytics and metrics to be able to determine what content is out there and the timeliness of it and the relevance of it. But since we have kind of a closed loop uh, system internally for our for our customer, um, for our, kind of our CRM pieces, you know, one of our elements that we had is we had some decent um, customer, you know, sales performance metrics based on merchandise, based on promotions, based on time of year, and we we've, we've gathered this information over time, but we really didn't have any tools to leverage that information back into to to generate and drive that content back out. So I know that from a a, a larger perspective that affects a multi different industries. The social media and more of the digital marketing has more of a real-time feedback, but in in retail especially, we have the opportunity to use, you know, let's say a a print um, vehicle, a print promotion piece to drive traffic into a store, and then use you know real-time or close to real-time analytics and data out of that POS system if we've got the right build to to um, to generate the second level of engagement. So in other words, if I send you to the store with a, a printed piece out of your newspaper or something that I sent you in, in the mail, and you go and, and activate based on that marketing, you know, it's in our best interest to be able to leverage what you just did into kind of a re-engagement strategy, which is something that without kind of a, a way to manage the actual assets and the content is is impossible. We, you know, our best kind of ability to re-engage based on that information is is uh, you know months weeks at best without yeah. uh, technology and automation and with technology and automation we we hopefully could could get you a, a relevant re-engagement message you know the same day or, or preferably before you even leave the store yeah I mean it enables you to do things like a B testing which you know, would traditionally take weeks or months to get your feedback. But you can do it within right. hours or days. You know, um, yeah. and then you can. You know, it's no longer just an A B test; it can be an A B C D. However many. Yeah. Right, because we're getting back to uh, big data, and and the more different streams of uh, feedback we have, the better we can kind of massage and direct that marketing message. And you know, people are always uh, uh, good-naturedly hopefully complaining about the, the constant shift of technology but I really think that's what makes this such an interesting and exciting uh, industry to be in because it is always uh, in flux and it is always uh, presenting new opportunities or new ways to basically uh, drive what really is communication on the back end. Um, I, I know that online video is really kind of the, the fastest and largest growing ad format with you know over 50 percent growth last year. Um, can we, is anybody interested in speaking a little bit about the challenges specific to producing and managing video content and any solutions that you've used to address those issues? Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, this is John. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, one of our biggest challenges is, uh, is third-party players. Mm. And we have we have so much content that's being generated internally, right. and we have so much out there that is uh, that, that we have to go as a third party because of their their expertise. Um, getting that content back, uh, find, finding where that content is going, capturing that that information again. Um, there there really is just so much of it that is being produced, and then and then throw in user generated. Right, and how do you manage that? I mean, that, that's a that's a business discussion that, that needs to go. Yeah, on for, your... for an agency, where does that responsibility lie? You're you're no longer creating the creative. You have the users. How do you manage that that fire hose of information? Well, again, we, we rely heavily on our our, our third party vendors, um, but quite often there's some great stuff, and we want to repurpose that as well. But then we have we have potentially legal issues that we have to address right. and we're trying to you know we're trying to react so quickly that a, a traditional workflow doesn't work as well as it used to I mean, it just takes time we don't have that time to get things out um, so user generated is, uh, is is a big area for us for for the foreseeable future managing it uh, reusing it 
and um, and then making sure wherever it is out there that we're we're pulling it back in time or we have the the, the proper legal uh, legal authority to use it. Mark, what about you? Yeah, and we have any other. Oh, we, go ahead, Brian. We, we have we have exactly the same and similar issues, and I think the the real problem is also delivery of those various video content, particularly because unfortunately the world hasn't quite got the same bandwidth or requirement as you'd expect in North America or in Europe. It varies greatly. So our complication not just comes around the fact of these uh, generated uh, video content, but also the multi-language variations thereof. So it, it really puts pressure on how you manage your data from the very beginning. So how you actually uh, uh, wrap it in metadata, how you go and search it, how you actually transcode it in the first phase and put it into your asset engine. All of those things are where we're spending. Uh, you know, when I hear big data, I tend to worry about the assets we're holding and worrying about the petabytes of data or the exabytes of data that we're holding as opposed to um, the analytics that you can apply to big data. Interesting. Uh, Brian, what about uh, from the JCPenney perspective as far as managing? Yeah, I, w I was going to say we have, you know, we have um, a, a kind of a unique issue in that a lot of the video content that that our group is responsible for managing. Now, we have video content, uh, I guess luckily for us, a lot of the promotional and advertising video content that is created and managed is really um, managed through our some of our agency partners for broadcast um, marketing but our biggest challenge with video is the product video in cases where we have um, vendor created product um, informational videos or product usage videos or product demonstration videos that are supplied to us by the vendors that we want to associate with our you know e-commerce um, storefront, so our online presence, and so first of all, we didn't have the the, the platform, our, our e-com platform didn't have the ability to kind of support those uh, multiple renditions, if you will, of content that need to be created for, you know, uh, the best user experience on the back end, so we have, you know, kind of a, a third-party hosting that we use for the delivery of the content. But our issue re revolves around kind of the internal approval because our merchants are the, the, the primary contact for these vendors. And so if we've got a vendor that um, has video content that they want to supply to us that we would like to put on our site, we're getting that in through you know, various different ad hoc channels to the merchants. And what we have to do is find a way to get it into a system where our creative teams can look at it and make sure that it meets our brand standards. Um, our, uh, you know, our our marketing communications and planning group can kind of look at it from an overarching perspective and see if it fits into whatever whatever their needs or concerns are. And so we have a lot of different, you know, um, cooks in the kitchen, if you will, when it comes to video content, because you've got the product owner, you've got the creative owner, you've got the uh, promotional strategy owners and how do we get in in a collaborative way how do we get that video in get it looked at and approved or or or, um, or rejected by whoever needs to see it and then get it passed on to that third party uh, provider in order to create those renditions and then feed back that you know embedded link of that final video content into our site and so we've kind of got this three or four step process that is is n unmanageable by any kind of manual process. You can't you couldn't even scale to you know you couldn't hire enough people to manage the process of getting it approved and routed through the right channels. And so that's where you know technology is an you know an absolute required element for us to be able to get the video content, the product video content, on site um, that we need to. And one of the things I, I heard you mention there, Brian, is just about collaboration. Uh, and whether you're on a single brand like JCPenney or uh, serving the needs of multiple brands like the agencies, you're, you're constantly having to keep that in mind. Um, 
you know, Mark, what are, what are some of the most critical things to get right when you're planning for and evaluating uh, marketing automation solutions like digital asset management or uh, video production and, and, and hosting? Mark, are you still with us? All right, I think maybe Mark has dropped off. Uh, John, actually, do you mind um, answering what are some of the most critical things that in your... Hello. Oh, Mark, there you are. Sorry, no, I'm back. Um, it's that age-old adage of people, process, and then technology. So you really have to get your head around what your either internal or external processes are before you start to then map your technology solution over the top. And what we find ourselves more and more getting involved with is, is how we integrate various different technologies, because there really mm -hmm. isn't one tool out there that does everything. So when we start going shopping for tech, one of the first questions we seem to be asking these days are, you know, what's the API look like? How does it integrate? Right. Because our other problem is we have an awful lot, as I'm sure we all do, legacy systems that we're already vested in that we have to find a way to still play with. So you mean there isn't one magic pill that solves all your problems? Apparently not, no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I know, but people, processes, and tech are, are good fundamentals to start with. Are there any other critical things outside of uh, those general areas that anybody needs to plan for when evaluating? Well, I, I think that uh, this is uh, John chiming in here. I, I, I think you have to be prepared for uh, calculated growth. So obviously you've got to have some some finances that are set aside. You've got to have some management that is uh, that is on board with the the, the concept of of uh, of our industry. Sure, um, you need that executive buy-in because you need a oh, bigger visibility and in, in what else may be coming down the pipe. You you do you do. So there's there's uh, there's definitely some collaboration and uh, change is, is is challenging within a large environment. Um, so you do need that that management buy-in to, to force that change. And quite often with, with the technologies that, that we have available, it's, it's not changing what people are doing that much. It's really, it's really a lot of finessing. Um, I, I think it's very important what, what Mark was saying about establishing uh, you know, what those needs are, looking at the various systems, uh, having, having tech on board so they, uh, they do understand what, a, uh, what an API what, what, what documentation um, is out there? What uh, what what sort of configuration we can do to to bring all of these various systems and different cultures and, and people together to and, and uh, when to accomplish what those those goals are? And when you're looking at those solutions, John, are you? Uh, I, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this in a way that's not uh, insulting to my IT uh, colleagues, but are you bringing IT initially into the initial evaluation, or are you trying to narrow down your field of potential candidates first and then bringing IT in a little bit later on in the process? Uh, there's, I have a great working relationship with our IT team, and there's, so there's, there's a lot of uh, collaboration and communication that goes on. Uh, so there's an awareness. But the, it is the it's the business needs and objectives that drives what that is. Uh, quite often, what we do it from a, for, you know for, with the technology we're, we're using, uh, these are overhead costs too. You know, so it's 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 a it's a, a required investment for us, and um, the the we we see the we see the value so much more with. With all of this new content coming in too, right? Because we're we're really catching up uh, to the volume of it. So the um, the the connection with with our uh, IT group is uh, is very tight and very important. And uh, depending on the systems you're going to, there it, there's certainly security and network concerns that you have to have. Uh, do we need more more server space, or are we um, relying on a on a third party? system to, to manage whatever that uh, that goal is. But not everybody has the luxury of having a really solid working relationship with IT. And, and it's not necessarily a, a, a fault 
of the individuals per se, but I know in a giant organization like JC Penney, um, <laughs> <laughs> merely finding the right person within IT can be a challenge because you've got you've got hardware teams, OS teams, you've got physical server access teams, you've got network teams, and you know any one endeavor or any any one solution touches on a whole host of different groups. So um, it, it can be a challenge in trying to manage that end of the process. It is, you know, and, and, and here, I guess one of the advantages that I have, I can't, um, you know, I, I know the people and I know the teams to do this. You know, one of the things that you pointed out earlier and kind of touched on that, that is, you know, a key element to this, I think John was talking about it, he's getting that kind of executive level support and buy-in. And unfortunately, we've got a couple of things stacked against us in our environment. First of all, um, marketing in our world, you know, this investment in this technology is looked at from our perspective as a company as a, as a cost. You know, marketing is a cost center in our organization. We make money by selling products, right? So we don't make any money by marketing. We, we spend money on our marketing. On the agency side, you know, I think that there's a, maybe a, a, I don't want to say it's easier to make the case, but there's a lot more uh, fundamental need to invest in technology because the services that you're selling and the, 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 the ability to provide that best-in-class service is based around the technology and the ability that you have to kind of provide that, that cutting-edge holistic solution that companies like us are looking for. So when you're inside of a company and your organization is a cost center and not a, a profit center, you have one card stacked against you. And then you have the, uh, the uh, kind of the, the, the difficulty of selling technology to uh, a, lot of, a lot of times leadership that doesn't necessarily understand the need for the technology. They've seen that things have always been able to operate the way that they ha have operated and don't understand why you can't just scale to you know, with people to, to accomplish the same task. Um, and then once it comes to the, the IT and the other business relationships, it gets even more complex because, you know, we have a marketing department, right? But we also have a, an IT group, and then we also have um, our digital platform or our e-commerce group, which is a whole separate unit to themselves. And so there's a little bit of crossover in the way that marketing works, but our issue is that we don't, it's not a matter of just getting a particular IT partner on board because within the IT team we've got the risk management team and we've got the network team and we've got the server team and we you know so it, it, it's almost this this exponentially growing relationship of who you have to sell and and talk about this to so even if you know the right people to get the conversation started you you have to rehash all of the benefits, all of the needs, or the purpose of the of the technology, the benefit of the technology, the use of the technology to multiple levels within those organizations and then you have to get back to the other kind of underlying issue that nobody can avoid which somebody mentioned earlier which is how does this integrate with all of those other systems that you've got, the, the legacy systems or the, 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 on, the, the, um, the other technology elements that other departments are investing in and so you know our issue here is that we've we've evolved enough to realize as a company that we can't get where we need to go without the investment in the technology but we haven't evolved to the point where the company has made a decision to create a a, a specific uh, leadership level position that is responsible for the overall um, kind of uh, development and uh, implementation of a marketing technology strategy. So I, I think that that's kind of the next step for us as a company is once we've gotten enough people to realize that it's inevitable um, for our success that we invest in marketing technology, that we kind of define that as a, as a, a business group with a business owner who can kind of represent that need across all of the, the, the company. Well, and, and that success, you know, generally you need, you need some sort of criteria, but, you know, Mark, how do you measure internal user satisfaction or that user experience, and, and do you translate that into ROI? Is that really necessary, or are you just saying, hey, 
we did what you asked. Everybody should be happy now. Oh, I think in my world, we very quickly hear when people aren't happy. Um, it was quite interesting hearing some of the, the challenges uh, the last speaker was facing in terms of what goes on at Josie Penney's and having, um, I don't know, stakeholders that are fully engaged in what the technology ask is. It's pretty similar in the agency world too, because sometimes we have a confusion that when we say technology, sometimes some of our uh, leadership hear um, digital, and then when they hear digital, they hear app, and then they disappear off down a, a, a <laughs> rabbit warren all around creativity. Um, so, so we've had to work quite hard to um, translate, probably, into what we think technology is. And, and this goes to answer your question, Rich. Part of that was we had to build quite a lot of business models showing how the adoption of technology in certain parts of our business would lead to an efficiency that therefore would actually affect a change in the business. And you know, efficiency is that great euphemism for we either reduce headcount or form some part of consolidations. So one of the biggest areas, funnily enough, for us over the last 12 months as an organization has been all around how we control our assets and, and more importantly, where we put them. So moving to sort of the, the, the data center uh, dispersed storage has been one of the biggest things we've been doing. And the only way we got there, because the investment is heavy, is being able to take it as a business case to our management and say, here's your investment, here's how it pays out over the next three to five years, because that actually is, is fundamentally important. And I think John will probably agree, sometimes um, the agency organizations can be a tiny bit myopic when you talk to them about a plan for three to five years. Yeah, that's uh, um, where we're, we're so um, there's so much reactionary activity that's going on uh, because we are we are trying to address immediate needs. Um, I fortunately we have a a, uh, a great strategic uh, thinking leadership group right now. It, um, we've really done a super job pulling in some some uh, really bright minds that are that are forward thinking. And seeing what those those outputs are, so there's an understanding of the things that we need to do. Uh, there are these so these these various deliverable, deliverables in in many many different areas. Um, so you can you can move those lines back to where you know there is some centralized management of all of this content, and so there's because of all the, the varied deliverables, because that map is, is all over the globe now, there, there's, there's a direct uh, relationship and understanding uh, that there has to be a, a group managing the content and there has to be technology to, to be able to get our deliverables out quickly. Uh, so it, yes, it is challenging to, to have people think so many years out and to make that uh, that investment in a lot of the technology and the, 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 the people to support that technology. Um, but our, our company, fortunately, we're, um, we, we are doing that and we're doing it pretty well. So there's, there's, there's good opportunities for us next year. But are you managing the, or measuring the internal user satisfaction level. Are, are you doing, you know, uh, Survey Monkey, or, you know, are there any other methods that you're using to regularly poll your user base, and not just find out did you solve the problem, but are you more satisfied? Are you more productive, and therefore, are you generating more revenue for the organization? Well, we're not doing. Um, you know, I, I certainly, I haven't done that in a while. Uh, with Survey Monkeys and the like. But what I am doing is is working uh, very actively with all these all the various groups. So if if they're getting their deliverable um, executed quickly and uh, without fault, then we have tremendously satisfied internal customers. Um, right, and uh, you know, know. you're you're able to do it in that sort of familiar way because you you physically see these people on a regular basis, so you can you have to you know sure and that's just. Yeah, it, it, it kind of goes back to uh, some things that Brian was talking about too. Is you know, once you get this, um, you know, you kind of get this, this deck together. It's a, it's your your sales pitch of of what the heck you're you're doing is. Um, you're constantly selling that internally, right? And then and each unit can kind of grow from there as well. 
Um, so we find that our success is uh, is realized when the these various workshops are coming back for for um, for more growth. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the approach that we took here, John. Is it's kind of I call it like the spoon feed method. In other words, when we started to sit down and look at this a few years ago, we didn't have a specific technology group. My group had just been created. We had uh, two different business units coming together. One that was one that handled all of their production work through um, third-party outsourcing, um, and, and the other who had a kind of a, a fully integrated internal workflow. And we had to go to the lowest common denominator, which was a completely manual workflow. And so when I, when, when they created my group, we sat down and really mapped out what the potential use of technology was in um, just in a vacuum without relationship to the company's financial position, without relationship to our existing technology or the capabilities, or even really frankly the, the capabilities of the technologies that existed at the time. We just sat down and said, if we were imagining how the, our process would fit together most efficiently from beginning to end, let's put that map together. And then what we started to do was to break it off in chunks for the things that we could realize, like the, the lowest hanging fruit, if you will. So we said, look, our production process is in desperate need. We're closest to that business unit. We can sell that to one person and we can kind of bring this product in in a very narrow scope to solve this need. And if we take the right time and engage the right internal users to get their acceptance, then hopefully it would build a natural momentum and um, you know thank God it did because otherwise I'd be out of a job right now but what we were able to do is kind of bring in a little piece of production and improve it and when people when we were able to solve the problems that people were most uh, vocal about and, and improve their efficiency first of all we didn't you know we, we're kind of our, our own survey monkeys here because we uh, we have a very vocal group of users on the creative side that will, will let us know if anything is, is causing them any difficulty in, at all. And, and they're very of, of change averse. So we were able to kind of, you know, engage them, keep them, uh, take their needs into consideration, and improve the things that they needed to, to, um, to have improved on in order to, to increase their efficiency. And, and as we were able to kind of move this way, then people started saying, oh, well, why don't we do this? And so we just let those conversations occur naturally. And even though we had thought of them, and even though we had solved these problems on our roadmap, we let those people think that those were their ideas. And so we were saying, <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, why don't we do that? Let's go. Go, go find your, go get your boss to spend some money on that, and we'll be happy to do it. So um, we kind of laid the groundwork for, for everybody else to kind of sell the benefits of our products as we brought them in. It's devious, but I like it. It gets you the end result, which is the important thing. That's, that's um, all I care about. Yeah. Well, another good point that you mentioned too is just scope. You know, and there's scope is a wonderful tool, but you got to use it very carefully because if, if you keep your scope very narrow, for in your case, Brian, a very a single department, um, then the deliverables are much easier to achieve. But that also means that all of your funding has to come from a single department where if you increase the scope and you try and bring in more groups, you increase the likelihood that more people are going to want it and you have more budgets to pull from, but you also get more features and you get a longer implementation time. And so there's generally a good balance here. I, I know, Mark, you certainly uh, deployed more than your fair share of solutions, but when you're considering scope versus ROI, is there a, a good sort of ratio or a good sort of balance between either a large scope and a large group of people, or a small scope and a small group of people? That's a really good question, and, and you'd assume in the world of technology there'd be a very left brain answer. Um, <laughs> the, the reality is that the more you can scale your technology investment, i.e. the more users you've got using it, the, the obviously the better the ROI. So in the past, certainly within our side of the industry, a lot of the uh, DAM solutions or even technology solutions were quite locally based, so either local office based or country based. So what we're pushing quite heavily at the moment is, is much more enterprise stroke platform type solutions, which in of itself is another set of challenges. But no, we don't have a, uh, again, I, I keep looking for these magic bullets and magic formulas, we don't have a magic formula that defines investment versus ROI. Um, 
some of the bigger phase, you know, things like the, the, the data centers and cloud computing, that, that gets quite obvious. But some of the smaller phase in terms of automated automation around EDMs or making your CRM play nice with your uh, uh, digital tools, you know, it's quite hard to do. You, you end up, I think as someone just said, you work with a very tight team. So you, you hear very quickly if they see value or benefit in what you're doing. And you're using that to kind of uh, ad hoc or um, uh, improv your way to the final solution because you, you, you understand or you have that communication. It's, it's such a short line between end users and the people who are directing the solution. Yeah, I, I know it sounds terrible to say ad hoc, but yes, it pretty much comes off like that uh, because it, it's, you know, it's quite interesting what's changing in the industry. The change seems to happen every second that day. So, you know, last week or last month we were worrying about Facebook. Now we're worrying about the next iteration, you know, uh, Snapchat or something like that. So um, we can't stand still. It would be great to be able to write uh, a use case or a vision for the next three years that we knew we could stick to, but I think the vision is probably evolution and it's constant. Does that mean that you need to scale down your ROI projections? I mean, because, you know, again, as uh, as was stated before, ultimately you've got to have, you're, you're basically a salesperson, right, because you have this vision, you have this idea for how you can make the business better, and you need to consistently present that message and manage that message both at the internal uh, mid-level manager level as well as up to your executive team. Do you, as part of that argument back to, say, your executive team, do you keep your ROI on a much shorter scale, um, you know, to, to avoid the problems of trying to plan for three or five years down the road? Partly. Um, it, it's, you know, the, the last couple of years has been quite easy to kind of define ROI because really it's, it was more about consolidation. So, you know, leveraging the spend we have globally to produce uh, platforms and enterprise solutions was a good way to go. It was very easy to see how we could make the, the dollar go further. Actually, where it's going to get harder is as we become more mature in this space, it's, you know, what does next year look like and the year after? So, yeah, ROI is something we're definitely um, spending our time focusing on. It's just that we haven't got a model that is um, that can be explained very easily. Excellent. Um, I just want to pause here briefly, uh, do a quick time check. We've got about 18 minutes left scheduled. We are happy to take any questions that anybody from the audience may have. Uh, and I know uh, Mohan has been quiet, which is unusual for him. I want to make sure that he gets a chance to participate as well. Um, so, you know, maybe from the North Plains perspective, Mohan, you could tell us what, what should an organization look for in a systems integrator as opposed to just a, a software manufacturer? I mean, do you have any perspective or thoughts on kind of the, the, the middle ground in between the software manufacturer and the end user? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, um, the value that the system integrator brings is just that domain knowledge. Um, as, as a vendor, we work across multiple verticals. Um, so, you know, we, we understand the domain of the, where the product works well, but we don't necessarily understand everything about the end customer. And that's where an SI can be really beneficial, where they can help, um, you know, take the, the product as a solution and apply it to that particular business. Um, you know, for me, the best projects are where both the vendor and the SI work in partnership. So you've yeah. got the domain knowledge of the product and the domain knowledge of the business, um, and that can work out really, really well um, because you're playing off each other's strengths. And you're you're typically dealing with engineers, and engineers love to argue, right? So if you have, <laughs> it, well, you do. You want a difference of opinion, or at least you want yeah. the breadth or of experience, so that you can have not just one educated person who's giving you uh, his or her opinion, but a team of them who are arguing. Yeah. And, and trying to come up with a consensus about the best uh, way to move forward. I mean, because it could be as simply as you have a customer, uh, you know, we talked a lot about the challenges of um, large IT organizations. And, you know, in large environments, IT has a unique way of working in every customer. Um, there's some similarities, but there's just unique ways of working. And, you know, an SI that has that existing relationship for us can be very beneficial because they can help us get the solution deployed in a shorter time frame. If we get it deployed in a shorter time frame, we can show value quicker. And for me, that's the, um, the point we want to get to quickly, uh, where our product is being used by our customers successfully and showing real business benefit. Um, yeah. 
and that you can get to that value very quickly. I know we certainly have most customers try and be conservative on that ROI, and they may plan for a a 24 month uh, return. But uh, mm -hmm. John or Mark or Brian, have have any of you been able to really kind of surprise? folks with how quickly that ROI can be realized? Well, I, this is Brian. I, I think for us, um, you know, one of the, the biggest difficulties that I had in the beginning um, was to present um, uh, a, a compelling ROI based on the narrow scope that we were trying to bring this in under. In other words, we were looking at bringing in a system strictly just to manage the the image assets that were related to our print production jobs. I mean, that is the very first kind of baby step that we took in, in selling this. And unfortunately, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, fortunately we had a really good small team that jumped through hoops and made things happen um, without anybody ever really knowing that it was inefficient. And so, in other words, we had a group of five or six people who just busted their butts uh, all the time to make sure that they were able to juggle and keep all the balls in the air. And so nobody ever really knew that there was a need for this. And for us to go back and say, hey, well, let's invest in this technology to better manage this, you know, I, I, I didn't, uh, the way that I had to present it was that we didn't necessarily, we weren't looking at investing in technology to reduce the number of people that were doing the work that we were needing to invest in technology to be able to have that same group of five people do the work proactively. In other words, do the work on the front end rather than chasing the problems on the back end. And unfortunately, the, the end result, the net result of that argument is, hey, we need to spend money, but I can't really show you that we're going to save any money. We just will put ourselves at less risk. I think where I was able to really turn the corner with uh, the ROI argument and, and the benefit that we were able to see more quickly that, it, quite frankly, in the beginning I was having a hard time explaining or selling was the benefit of better um, uh, metadata management and taxonomy and leveraging that information because we kind of talked about metadata for years around here in this generic term as in, oh, the metadata is in the image, but our terminology was not consistent with how we needed to use metadata. So what we had the photo studios doing when we had content created was to put every piece of metadata, the job information, the, the accounting information, the product information, all just into basically a paragraph of comma separated information into the keyword field. And and it was, you know, it was better than nothing, but it certainly didn't provide us the ability to leverage any of this content across multiple channels. So once we were able to kind of get our metadata schema refined and really allow our internal clients better access to more relevant content and then the ability to drive and leverage that off into different channels, people saw that, oh wow, here is the return on this investment. I can find these images in time to get the relevant content in front of the customers. So our return on investment became calculating the um, increased time, what we call you know speed to site. So we were able to reduce our speed to site you know, from the time that the, the, the product was photographed until the time it was available for sale from you know eight weeks down to three weeks over over time and then we were also able to reduce our photography cost by you know 20 25 percent for our, our e-commerce and so we were able to show that the value of having these systems was in is in uh, kind of managing the uh, data integrity and the quality of the content in there and and so um, we kind of stumbled into that benefit, but that's where we found the benefit, and, and we were able to realize it a lot quicker than we ever thought we would. So it wasn't necessarily just a financial ROI. You, you were able to show value outside of the, the fiscal side. Yeah, we had trouble kind of uh, putting our arms around the financial ROI based on the, we, you know, we were saying, well, we need to get it in here for this purpose, but I can't really tell you how you're going to be saving money with in this specific realm by doing this, but then we kind of found that having a better management and, and kind of a, an overarching process for uh, managing, curating, and distributing that content had these huge financial benefits to other areas. So, you know, kind of the, the, the trade-off there was that I had to get my boss to spend the money on this investment to get us started, but his department didn't see any of the benefits. 
the long-term benefit was that the departments that did see benefits in efficiency or accuracy or uh, you know the speed to site elements they they then in turn said wow this works let us give you some more money to grow this and so you know it, it's almost like the old adage you know you have to spend money to make money or whatever it, we had to spend we had to invest in something that didn't necessarily benefit us directly in order to kind of get everybody else to kind of get the fire lit for everybody else to invest in things that would benefit the company as a whole. But that's why, going back to John's point earlier about executive support or executive buy-in, why that's so important because you, you need somebody who's sitting at the table who understands, yes, I, I can't explain it to the CFO how this is making us more money, but it's giving us opportunities elsewhere. Uh, John or, or Mark, do you have any other examples of non-financial ROI where you were able to make the argument for the investment outside of necessarily additional revenue streams or decreased costs? Yeah, Rich, um, I, I think that I, I've seen the discussion changed a, a little bit in the past couple of years. It used to be, hmm. it used to be projections for ROI. Yeah, you know, and how do we how do we justify the expenditures that, that we're making now? Now, when we're sitting at the table with with executive management, they're saying, "I need to do this," right? So they have they're they're saying these are all of the things that we have to deliver for our clients, and how do we best do that? So now we can come in and say, "This is this is what we can do with what we've we've put into place," and if we want to do this, you know, X plus. We'll need this 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 investment. So it's there's it, it now it's more of a, a it tends to be more of a pulling of of that um, that information and the the ROI that um, I mean so they're pulling us forward and then we're able to justify or or capture I guess that ROI based on all of the the new activities that we've been we've been asked to to do. But that involves a certain amount of trust. Oh, it's, right. it certainly does. In um, it, 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 yeah. Go ahead, Mark. No, it's Brian. I was going to say that's actually a very good point. I think that, that, that oh. there is a I, there we there really is kind of an element of this being pulled forward because that's the same thing that we saw two years ago, three years ago. We were trying to explain how this would benefit things in the long term. Now, as technology and kind of the acceptance of these different channels and the value of these different channels has, has made itself apparent, now we, we have the same thing here internally where we've got leadership saying, hey, how do we do this? And that was kind of the onus that we put on ourselves in the beginning to think about where technology was going and to go ahead and, and have those answers in our back pocket so that when those inevitable questions came up of how are we, how, how are we going to do this or do we have the tools to do this, that we could say, yeah, we can just flip that on. We've thought about that already, and, and let the actual technology and, and and the evolution of the technology kind of um, be the driver, and and let, like you said, the uh, kind of the leadership and the executives pull us along in that direction. Yeah, and, and I I want to uh, ask Mark that same question about non-financial ROIs, but I, I do want to reiterate again, we're we got about seven minutes left in the presentation. If anybody has any questions for the panel. Uh, please use the GoToWebinar control panel. There's a chat window on the side. Uh, feel free to shoot us whatever questions you may have, and we'll bring them up to the team. Uh, but getting back to you, Mark, do you have any other examples of where you were making the argument or convincing the executive team to make an investment on something other than a financial basis? Uh, without a doubt, there are any one of a number of different levers that, that drive this sort of investment. And for certain, particularly of our retail customers, uh, it's it's around speed to market and how quickly that um, we can get from a, an asset to an executional piece that's actually in a consumer's hand, and how we need to invest in technology to allow us to do that. So there's been a number of instances, particularly in the last year, with um, particularly retail uh, clients, where we've been able to demonstrate a very simple investment in uh, workflows that come off the back of the asset engine. That this was a you know it was, it was a no-brainer. It was very simple to understand. We could do this in half the time. Therefore, you get your communication piece out in front of your clients, our customers quicker, or indeed you can change it quicker. And that seems to be the case. And we're seeing that more and more as a uh, an industry trend where the the brands are understanding better 
um, the, the leverage that they have from a marketing technology perspective. And I, and I think it's really because that <clears throat> the the barrier to entry into creative technology has dropped tremendously. You know, now when you can you can hire somebody who is basically just in charge of your Twitter feed, and you know, it, it's a to be able to do that from a technical perspective is nothing. You know, they can literally can do it. On I want control. that job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you want that job because you know that's a, again it's a double-edged sword. You know, what do you do? And there's been some really great examples of people who have used Twitter to beat up on large brands, and there's been some really smart brands who have used that to their advantage and said. I hear you. Let's take it offline. Uh, I'm going to look up your process, but you know that we're seeing more and more often that the brands are understanding, or at least becoming a little more savvy, that those creative technology solutions are sometimes within their own reach. Yeah. I know the from an agency perspective that has a whole other set of challenges because uh, you know how do you how do you justify the cost for a Twitter feed? How do you justify the the work that goes into a Facebook profile when, you know, somebody on the marketing team says, oh, "I could totally do that myself." Well, you just tell them to go ahead and do it, and when they um, fail or ruin their whole brand because they don't really understand how to engage people, then you go back and say, "Would you like me to do it now?" And, and I think that's really the point I'm I'm trying to make. The agencies still they understand creative; that is their core competencies. Uh, and, and the brands, while they're getting more educated and, and doing a better job of understanding the technology, they still need partners. They still need people who are have the expertise in creative uh, execution or technical execution, and it, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. Any other uh, final? Ooh, I do have a question. Uh, what what tends to be the most acceptable pricing model for uh, for PIN? Is it the monthly subscription, uh, or is it easier to kind of wrap up the technology with the services? Uh, Mark, let me push that one back off to you. Do you find generally there's one model for pricing that's better than others, monthly versus investment? Um, bad answer. It really depends what you're buying. Um, so for certain things, no, we will look at investment because it works for us. But um, software as a service, because of how that helps in terms of as things change as the world goes forward, it kind of helps you manage your prices a little bit better. That also works too. It really is, it depends what we're buying. And that ROI, is there enough bandwidth where you can validate that use, use case months later? Or is the value, as I think um, uh, John was talking about, more organic and being evaluated constantly? I think because how things are moving so quickly, and you know, like everybody else has said, the attention of our, if you like, our executive team is, is we've certainly got, because they can see the changes that is happening in the world and how we have to react to them. So no, it, it really is organic. And um, in my world at the moment, it almost feels daily. Mm. Like you really have your finger on that that pulse of how effective this is. Yeah, we can see definite changes in in our, how we go to market, how we deal with our customers, and the efficiencies we're getting. We can pretty much see it daily. But then, you know, our world is changing quite dramatically at the moment. But that's a good thing. That that's what keeps us all in business. <laughs> You know, God forbid Absolutely. we should be doing the same thing today that we were doing last year. You know, I, the challenges are a good thing. Uh, so with that, uh, we're just kind of we're just about ready to wrap up. I want to uh, thank Brian from J.C. Penney, John Bookmeyer, uh, Team Detroit, Mohan, of course, our CTO from North Plains, and uh, and Mark from eGraphics. Uh, it, it's been a wonderful hour. Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed this very much. I always enjoy good conversations with folks in this industry. Uh, don't forget, if you want to partake in any additional Henry Stewart events, go to henrystewart.com. Uh, lots of good webinars such as this as well as trade shows across uh, North America and Europe. Uh, if you have any other further questions, please feel free to reach out to any of the panelists uh, or myself, Rich, at IOintegration.com. Uh, and with that, I hope the rest of you have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.